And welcome once again to EWTN's Bookmark. I'm Doug Keck, your host. Our guest author is Patrick Coffin, author of Sex on Natural, What It Is and Why It's Good for Your Marriage, published by Emmaus Road Publishing. Welcome, Patrick, to Hi, EWTN's Doug. Bookmark. Great to have you I here. I appreciate the invite. Uh, People would probably know you better from the radio, though you've been on EWTN before on mm -hmm. uh, Jeanette Benkovic's program, but uh, actually on Radio Catholic Answers, right? Catholic Answers Live. Okay, yes. you've been doing that show for, what, 18 months, uh, two years on by now, about, 18 right? months or so, okay. yeah, year and a half. And how'd you get into doing radio? I had been a stage actor mm -hmm. in Canada, and I'd been a conference speaker and a part-time magician, so I had no fear of crowds. Mm -hmm. Um, do you I'm do a, magic on yeah. radio? That must be interesting. It's hard to make it's people believe. It's like ventriloquism, believe. like yeah. Edgar Bergen If the trick ago, fails, right? you can always say that it's working, <laughs> yeah. so That's it wonderful. works out well. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm a raised, rebelled, returned Catholic, and uh, always interested in media, always interested in uh, how to reach the average person who's outside the, you know, the bonds of the church with right. the gospel. Right. Um, one of my great heroes in life is Archbishop Fulton Sheen, sure, right. who kind of owned that idea right. of preaching outside Right, you quote him several times inside. Yeah, I, I love Bishop the, Sheen. I'm book. praying that he'll be the first American-born male saint. Um, but I, I had made a, a CD of a show, a radio, basically a demo show, mm -hmm. about four years ago, and I didn't even know why. Uh, it was called Pop the Culture, and I, I had this idea to, to, to create a show where I interview uh, architects of the culture of life. Mm -hmm. They didn't even have to be Christian. Um, and I saw that stayed on the shelf. And then I did a voiceover class with an actor in Los Angeles, and he was very encouraging. He said I had a real kind of a commercially viable voice if I wanted to, to mm -hmm. do that. Right. Well, I didn't. I just, it stayed on the shelf. And um, I heard that this job was uh, popping open, and I submitted that CD, right. and uh, I got a call back and auditioned, and I was the last man standing. So what, it's been a real What's the most blessing. interesting thing about doing that show to you? That I get to do it is the most interesting okay. show. I really, I, I say this and people don't believe me, uh, I drive to work many times wondering if they're going to, you know, do I still get to do the show? Mm -hmm. I, I love it. The idea of being the conduit between these great hearts and minds uh, to allow them to, to right. provide answers to, to listeners and uh, hearing from people mm -hmm. through the radio show whose lives were touched by something mm -hmm. that a guest said is How very much gratifying. prep work do you have to do actually before you do a show? The show is two hours. The rest of the, sh the, rest of the day is, is uh, creating the schedule, usually a month and a half in advance. If, the, if it's an author, I try to read as much of the book as I can. Um, it's probably 70-30, 70, 70 right. being preparation. Yeah. Right, because a lot of people think when you do radio, let alone television, that you, you kind of walk in, you do your hour, you do Tip of the iceberg, as you know. It's tip of the iceberg, yeah. Right. Now, a good friend of ours used to work here, Gina Rodeo used to work with Okay, that's right. She used right? to produce our show. That's, that's right. right. Gina had worked yep. here for a number of years. So, well, mm -hmm. let's talk about uh, the, uh, the author, Patrick mm -hmm. Coffin, Sex on Natural, you know, what it is and why it's good for your marriage. You know, a lot of times when people hear... That where people pull back a little bit, they say, "Oh, this is going to be something else in my in my face. Uh, mm -hmm. This culture out there, it's so coarse. Why do I have to have sex thrown on my face again?" Mm -hmm. That's not what this book's about. No, it? not at all. Uh, this is my love letter to Humana Vitae. Um, I I realized that when I was kind of floating around there, I never really officially left the church, but I was certainly not living from the bosom of the church. I, I never stopped going to mass, but I, I just there was some missing link and. Uh, Part of it was my own, uh, my own not seeking God with my, with all my heart, mm -hmm. and uh, I came across Humana Vitae through uh, just through studying it in university. And I'd never I'd heard about it and its bad reputation. But I never gave it a chance. Mm -hmm. And the first thing that struck me about it was it was so short. It's only mm -hmm. thirty-one paragraphs. Mm -hmm. and, what was uh, its bad reputation to you? Well. I, like many people, fell into the uh, misunderstanding that the church requires women to be baby factories. Okay. That unless you intended to have a child, you had no business, uh, you know, entering into the conjugal. And that's act, kind which of that pop true. quiz you have in the yeah, in the, the book, yeah. I have right? at the beginning. I have a twelve-question pop quiz, okay. and then a whole chapter devoted to answering right. the misunderstandings. Um, I didn't understand that unity and procreation are, are seen by Pope Paul VI as two sides of the same coin. They're mm -hmm. they're one entity. And when you separate them, you begin to split. Uh, well, marriages have split since the 60s, since Humana Vitae was rejected. Um, people feel split off from the church. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to explain the teaching in a way that wouldn't put people off, that wouldn't be moralizing, and that would give them a chance to see it on its own terms. So I just let it out of its cage. Mm -hmm. Now, why did you feel that this was something you were called to do? 
Great question. Uh, it was part of the reason why I came back to the church. I reasoned that if this encyclical is not true, I had no reason to believe that the rest of the Catholic teachings were true mm -hmm. because it had 2,000 years of consistent, strong, uh, coherent mm -hmm. condemnation of any form of, of prevention of birth. And that's, by the way, another reason why people uh, give Humana Vitae the, what I call the barge pole treatment. They, they think that uh, natural family planning is just a, a word game. Mm -hmm. Basically, it's just Catholic birth control. Right. And as John Paul the Great once said, they're two totally irreconcilable anthropologies. And you've got um, a whole chapter in this book on that. Yes. Basically. Yes. Talking um, about the difference of understanding that, right? Right. Yeah. And, and there's something about natural family planning that is conducive to marital friendship and unity. Um, a lot more research needs to be done on why that is. But it's, it's right, true. Right in the beginning of the book, right before the, the whole list of contents, there's a quote that says, Love is the power to make an outright gift, not a trade, by a John M. McGoey. Mm -hmm. John McGoey was a Canadian priest. Okay. Scarborough Foreign Mission Society priest. Uh, he's mentioned by Dorothy Day in her autobiography. Right, you said they were. Yeah, yeah, he died in 1995. He was kind of a mentor to me, and he wrote a lot on uh, emotional maturity and uh, love, sexuality, and marriage. So he was very influential. Mm -hmm. Now, the forward of this book is done by a very well-known and powerful author, Peter Kreeft, who says, I'm very happy to read this book because otherwise I'd have to write it myself. He goes on to say it's written for everyone, not just for scholars, but it's not popular in the usual sense of dumbed down or shallow, and it's complete. Mm. What do you think about that? I can't believe I got him to write it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my bribes paid off. No, I, I, th I think highly of Dr. Kreeft. Uh, his reading his books helped me bring me back to the, uh, to the heart of the church. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm grateful that he kind of, he, he got me. Right. Yeah. Now you, in the very beginning, in the acknowledgments, you go through all the people who helped you, but you, you say how this began as a public lecture given at Pierce College in Los Angeles, sponsored by the IA Jewish Family Services and the Encore Oasis Adult Education Program. Now that seems like a pretty unusual place for this idea to, be, to spring from. It was. I was asked to represent the Catholic Church in a series of talks. They had been, uh, at Pierce College, they had a 13-week yearly seminar, and they had two different kinds of Judaism and two or three different kinds of Buddhism, and they had Wicca. They didn't have Catholics represented. So, How many versions of Catholicism did they have? Just one? <laughs> Zero. It <laughs> wasn't even covered. It wasn't even covered at so all. So I, I, a woman named Mary Melton uh, encouraged me to, to uh, get in the game and mm -hmm. just do a talk on the church. So I did. I, I showed up, and they, I guess they scraped the bottom of the barrel, and mm -hmm. they came up with me. So they invited me back. The people at, at Pierce College invited me back, and they said, why don't you, why don't you pick something more controversial, something specifically Catholic. So I didn't take me long to come mm -hmm. up with Humana Vitae. So mm -hmm. the first talk was called A Bitter Pill to Swallow, question mark. Mm -hmm. And those talk notes grew, and then it became a chapter, and then I realized, yeah, I, I have a book here. Mm -hmm. And like Dr. Crave said, uh, this book doesn't exist, and it probably needs to. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wrote it for people who are on the fence, Doug, mm -hmm. or people who are looking for ammo to, to simply explain and defend it. If, if you're a hardcore dissenter, as I once was, I'm not sure if anything I write won't put much of a dent, because it has to do with the will, and uh, this is very threatening. Well, you have to be lifestyle. open to considering too, right? If you've got your mind closed, it's right. very difficult. Yeah. So, I, I, in my own journey, I had to ask for the grace right. to have the grace to be open. Well, that's the trick. Yeah. Once you ask the Lord to enlighten you, right. the opportunity certainly yeah. is there. Right. And then it's really up to you. Also, I notice in here about the, the book's title, which I alluded to earlier, and you say the book's main title was lifted from a book review. Yeah, so. by an Orthodox writer named Federica Matthews Green. She's an NPR commentator, and she wrote a review of another book, and I thought that is a great, handy way of summarizing what the Catholic Church teaches. Uh, au naturel meaning unclothed. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, a married love without the intrusion of contraception. I see. Okay. Uh, or the openness, not just to life through, through children, but also the openness to deepening the, your friendship with your wife. In the introduction, right, actually before you have that little pop quiz, uh, you start off with the little encyclical that could, and you were kind of talking about it. If a contest were held for most misunderstood teaching, the Catholic Church's rejection of contraception would run away with the blue ribbon. You go on to say the explanation challenge is compounded by the fact that two generations of Catholics, along with everyone else, have been conditioned to see birth control as an instrument of women's liberation, a panacea for marital strife, and you go on yeah. and on and on. The pill turns 50 this year, Doug, and none of its promises have come true. Women, are, uh, women do not, by and large, feel more liberated. Uh, marriages are not lasting longer, if anything. 
uh, more and more couples are breaking up. Mm -hmm. Uh, what did come true, however, are the things that Paul VI said would come true. Right. Isn't he, that amazing? He said things right. that he couldn't have known on a human level. Right. From government stepping in, deciding how many kids you would have, to the rise of, uh, of hardcore pornography, right. to the increase in the divorce rate. He saw it. All these things spike. And uh, the church and I certainly don't argue that, that contraception is, is behind all these woes. But I think you have to be willfully blind to not see some causal connection. Well, I'm old enough to remember when uh, these things were happening. And uh, the thing I always try to point out sometimes for people in retrospect is to realize at the time, people didn't have the record. They only had the suppositions. Mm -hmm. And in some ways, it, some of it made a lot of sense. No one wanted children, all of these things. But now, in retrospect, we see from a scientific methodology, this has not worked. But right. people continue to ignore that fact. Why? Well, it threatens their uh, sense of independence. You know, Americans especially, you know, we have the Declaration of Independence. We don't like foreign powers telling us what to do. Mm -hmm. And uh, Humana Vitae was rejected before it was released. There was a mm -hmm. Vietnam-style protest held at Catholic University right, in Washington. Right, you talk about it. In yeah, the it book. was hijacked right. and... Um, there was a lot of leaking going on during the... Very when deliberate they expanded the, uh, Yes, the, yes. Uh, now, John it started, it was actually, the original panel was put together by... By actually John the 23rd, John the 23rd right? and okay. it was meant to study natality, birth rate, and to look at this new invention that had just been approved in 1960 called Anavid, the first contraceptive pill. Mm -hmm. Was the pill the same kind of contraception as more uh, traditional methods, if I can put it that way, condoms mm -hmm. and so on? Right. Because it seemed to work silently with the woman's body. It wasn't, mm -hmm. a, it wasn't super abundantly obvious at first that this is going to deserve the same moral note, and of course it did and it does. Uh, but the church, I think, wisely took her time to articulate. In fact, Humana Vitae is mentioned tangentially in Gaudium et Spes in mm -hmm. one of the footnotes between numbers 48 and 50, um, that this is something um, that's being studied now and will give a definitive answer. But before that answer right. was given, yeah, the results of the, right. the com commission and, were leaked. And I remember at the time, uh, even being a kid, you know, the reaction was so negative in some ways because all the leaks had led people to believe that the church was going to say it was okay. Yes. And so when it didn't, it, it was like a firestorm. Right. Or as, as I say, a stink bomb. Right. right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think the expectations were so skewed in one way that in, in the summer of 1968, when the, the Holy Father finally released Humana Vitae, it was, uh, it was not well received. Mm -hmm. And even by some bishops' conferences, they kind of amended right some details. Of right, it. And particularly one in Canada, as I recall, yes. which you, you cite, actually. In the well, which I should say has been uh, de facto overturned. Mm -hmm. Every every time the, the Canadian bishops have addressed the problem of contraception, they have become more and more orthodox. Right. Uh, as, but there as you have, even on. not too long ago, you had someone standing up in the Canadian Bishops Conference speaking out for life and <laughs> the reaction to him. Right, yeah. Uh, as if they don't understand what the church teaches. I mean. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I was thinking of Cardinal Mark Ouellette of Quebec, mm -hmm. who was uh, found guilty of, of uh, speaking while Catholic <laughs> right. uh, with exactly. respect to pro-life. And right. he's now going to be the prefect. You mean for you actually believe these things? Yeah, yeah. You take right. them seriously. You live right. them out. Right. You can defend them. Yeah. Right. Now, in the section here, you say this book was written primarily for practicing Catholics, although evangelicals and other believers in Christ may wish to discover the depth of the biblical roots to support the ancient Christian rejection of contraception. As we will see, a growing number of Protestants are coming to appreciate the Catholic position. And then jump back to the pop quiz where you say Protestants have always accepted contraception. True or false? Mm -hmm. And of course the answer is false, right? Yes. In fact, that's one of the things that's kind of interesting is everybody acts like all of these understandings have been around for 2,000 years. Mm -hmm. When even the Protestant thing, if you go back to the Lambert Conference, you're talking about 80 years ago. Right. Basically. The Protestant reformers used language much more combative and strident than any Catholic pope. Uh, Martin Luther and John Calvin were dead set against any form of birth prevention. And I'm, I'm glad you brought this up, Doug, because mm -hmm. the church is not against... You could say that natural family, family planning is a kind of birth control in the sense of regulation. Mm -hmm. The Holy Father mentions this in Humana Vitae. What the church is opposed to is birth prevention. Mm -hmm. Any action before, during, or after the conjugal act, which is, uh, has as its aim the prevention of it coming to be of a new person. That's the problem. It's not that uh, you can't make any effort to regulate the number of children that are entering your family through natural means, through pausing or engaging based mm -hmm. on the woman's cycle. 
Right. Which is which in a is, natural way and not an artificial way. Uh, yes, but but I'm glad you brought that up too because the the distinction between artificial and natural doesn't really get to the moral problem. Okay. Because natural family planning, in a sense, uses un artificial things too, temperature, mm -hmm. the technology that uh, has arisen to to support the accurate method of natural family planning. The problem is the moral act mm -hmm. of preventing, and it could be technological, it could be right. some other means. Um, but yeah, all Protestants were un fully united with, with the Catholic Church until 1930. Right. Well, I think that also jumps ahead to the, one of the ones you talk about, the church teaches women should have as many babies as possible, which obviously right. is false as well, as you alluded to. And also, jump back to number six, one can be a faithful Catholic and still contraceptive in good conscience. Now, this is the one that I think, you know, and you deal with it in the book, and obviously with Cardinal Newman, who's, uh, you know, conscience is king kind of thing that people like to bring up. There has been a lot of confusion when it comes to this idea, and, and much of it many times because good people were told by people who they thought knew that it was okay in this kind of internal forum mm -hmm. sense. Explain. Conscience is certainly the connector between the individual and, and the creator, as Newman says. God does speak in the, in the depths of everyone's heart to say, do this and avoid that. St. Paul talks about this in Romans. Mm -hmm. But for a Christian who is deeply in love with the church Christ founded, your conscience has to be formed by that teaching. You have to shape yourself in the light of the teaching of Christ and, and, and the sacred scriptures. If you do that, and as Augustine says, love and do what you will, you'll, you'll be fine. But it has to be formed. You can't just say, mm -hmm. as Pinocchio said, you know, let your conscience be That's your why God. you have that Jiminy Cricket. The Jiminy Cricket, right, line. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. Because uh, people think, if I think about it and I decide to do it, it means this is my conscience saying it's okay, and that's not Correct, the case. yeah. It's a false dichotomy to pit your conscience against the church, because that presumes that the church's teaching is flimsy or it's somehow not reliable. Or that it's one yeah. in a series of th considerations. Right. The Pope's opinion. Right. And uh, many people, if you, if you read uh, media accounts having to do with anything that intersects with the Catholic Church, you can find three or four mistakes mm -hmm. in the first two paragraphs. And one of them, in this context, is the belief that, that it's a papal opinion that could be changed, changed by some right. future pope. Well, can you blame them? I mean, I didn't realize that the, the priest or Monsignor who made the announcement Mm -hmm. basically made sure at the time when it was announced that everybody understood it wasn't really infallible or something along those lines. There Is that was, correct? Did I read that right? Yeah, you did. Unfortunately, there was, there was a certain, um, there were problems, prudential judgments were made at the time that ended up not being as catechetically effective as they could have been. Mm -hmm. Um, to say that it's not infallible is technically true in, in the sense that this is not a dogmatic pronouncement. Mm -hmm. uh, Paul VI didn't intend to write that kind of document. It's not on, on a par with the assumption. However, it's infallible through the ordinary teaching of the church. This is something that is deeply embedded in the tradition, dating from the time of the church fathers. Uh, Pius XI explicitly mentions the, uh, the Onan incident in, in Genesis chapter 38 in his encyclical Casti Canubii. So this is not a teaching that can be changed because it's true. Mm -hmm. What I wanted to do with the book is explain to people why it's beautiful and why it's doable and, what, and what's in it for you. Mm -hmm. So Okay. And you also say that this book has an evangelistic purpose. Yeah. How so? I think our culture is so messed up about love, sex, and marriage and becomes so pornified. I mean, a generation ago, Doug, no one would dream that someone like Larry Flint would become a First Amendment hero that you can find Playboy magazine in, 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 almost in the 7-Eleven. I don't think that people will grasp the insights that the church has without the gr help from, from grace. Mm -hmm. And uh, once you give uh, our Lord a chance, you should put your seatbelt on because the, uh, the teaching is so in accord with who we are as, as people. And uh, it's the answer to what we long for. We long for perfect love that's total and fruitful and human and faithful. And that's the, that's the vision of sex from the church. It's not a frown, it's a smile. Right. Now you've got like basically broken down 11 chapters in an appendix. Uh, chapter 1 is a review of historical context, paved the way for the widespread rejection of Yamane Vitae. We talked a little bit about that. Mm -hmm. Chapter 2 describes the events that brought me gradually from disagreeing to, altogether with the teaching to not hating it all the way to passion. Mm -hmm. Acceptance. So it was a process for you. Oh, absolutely. With many missteps. Mm -hmm one step back, two steps forward, and so on. It was a circuitous route. 
Because this teaching, unlike the, let's say, a teaching on uh, the Blessed Virgin or the communion of saints, those kinds of teachings don't touch people where they live. Right, it doesn't exactly. really force them to make different decisions about how they live their lives. Right. This does. This right. goes to the heart of what it means to be a human being, uh, a, a child of God, a husband, a wife. Uh, once you right. put the lens on, you see the, your whole discipleship differently. Right, and so you go through the chapters. You talk about, about talking about uh, in chapter four, the norms of Unani Vitae in the Bible, which I guess is helpful as well for Protestants who mm -hmm. are starting to look at it, which you talk about that idea. Chapter five, contraception in light of the Blessed Trinity. Mm -hmm. What's the connection there? Yeah, it seems kind of remote. Uh, I took as a, my starting point that we're made in, in God's image and likeness. And if God is a trinity, then there must be some shade of similarity between us and the Trinity. And what's the Trinity? Well, the Trinity is three divine persons infinitely giving each other to the others, mm -hmm. even outside creation. And so uh, these insights just kind of popped up for me, and I, I, I fleshed them out. And I, I slowly realized that, that the, the way we're to love each other is the way the Trinitarian persons love each other, with no reservations. There's no me first attitude within the Blessed Trinity. And so for husbands and wives to start saying, I love you, but, mm -hmm. you know, it's kind of like giving someone a hug, but you're slipping your hand in there. So right. Really, it's kind of a contradiction. Right. Um, that's the more, probably the more poetic uh, chapter. Now you also talk in chapter eight, you talk about the so-called population explosion, mm -hmm. and also about, the, which I didn't, chapter nine takes up the most popular form of contraception, sterilization. I didn't realize that was the most popular. Yeah, it form. is. I devote a whole chapter to the question of sterilization, either vasectomy for men or tubal ligation for women. Mm -hmm. uh, the chapter is called Planned Barrenhood. Mm -hmm. It's a very delicate pastoral question because people who have done that, they've perhaps without really following out what that means in the long term, They've locked themselves in, or they feel they have. It's contraception to the nth degree, so many Catholics are afraid to bring it up with people who've been sterilized because they don't want to feel like they're judging them and so on. But really, the church does not require a reversal to be done. All that right. she requires is repentance. And so I, I show the effects on marriage that are represented by sterilization and, uh, and how it can help your marital friendship to, to convert and, and, and see the thing aright, even if you don't have the, the, the reversal. Now, when you were grappling with this issue and coming to the church's position, were you married at the time? No, it's I was not. No, I, I was single, but I, I, I had been a teacher, and uh, I was very interested in, in, in catechesis, but I didn't want to misrepresent the church, and I wanted to give my students the truth. And so that desire for the mm -hmm. truth ended up um, starting me on this path right. to full Catholicism. Right, and in and, and reading the book and the information, especially some of the early stuff uh, talking about uh, what you called about the false god rising, the false god popularity shows up every sign of spreading. A whole parallel religion has been thrown up in its support with the spread of devotion to it and the clergy of, as you mentioned, Hugh Hefner, Larry Flint. Mm -hmm. And you also say, if you were Satan and you wanted to draw people away from the Lord of life, what better way to bait them than with this plausible counterfeit? Mm -hmm. One of the things that struck me in reading this, you know, we're dealing with all the kind of priest issues and other problems inside the church. And I can see yeah. someone looking at this and saying, you know, you're kind of laying this on to me that I've got to live this very strict, perfect life. Mm -hmm. And then I read in the paper what's going on elsewhere, and I think, or, or, you know, I mean, uh, how does the church have the right to lay this on me? That's how I saw it. What are wizened celibates in Rome doing uh, in, in the bedrooms of the nation? You know, it seemed like an alien idea uh, being imposed on something natural and, uh, and, and happy-go-lucky. The fact is, the church doesn't impose anything, as mm -hmm. John Paul II says, she proposes. The Christian vision for human sexuality is the best possible thing for us because it comes from the hand of our Creator who knows us so well. If you want to know how, to, how a Toyota works, you go to Toyota and you get the owner's manual. Well, the sacred scripture and the catechism is our owner's manual. And uh, the um, answer to the problem of the sexual abuse scandals is not celibacy. It's not Catholic teaching on sexuality. It's fidelity. Mm -hmm. It's a crisis of faithfulness. Fidelity, fidelity, fidelity is the answer to mm -hmm. what's going on. Celibacy has been a saint-making machine for 2,000 years. Thank God. Um, and I think what the world needs um, now, Doug, is the witness of people who love with their whole heart and their whole mind, who give themselves to others without the taking involved 
in, uh, in the sex act. And that's why uh, celibacy is an inestimable gift, as John Paul, mm -hmm. excuse me, as Paul VI said. Uh, so, Let me ask you just before, yeah. as we wrap up, you dedicated this book to the memory of Naomi Rose Coffin. Hmm. Who is she? She was our daughter. Hmm. She had a very rare chromosomal disorder called trisomy 9. And we knew about 12 weeks gestation that there was serious problems. We didn't expect to see her at all, okay. but we had her for 15 days. And uh, that story um, was told in Lay Witness magazine. It's called Grace at the Heart of Grief. And uh, Naomi's our uh, a little angel. Did that have yeah. a big impact on you as well? Enormous, enormous. Uh, she gave us and continues to give us so many life lessons about the value of life. And I uh, wouldn't, I wish she was here bouncing on my knee, right. but uh, we're grateful for her. And, and I'm grateful for the invite today. Well, thank you so much. Just to ask you before you go, another yeah. book in the works, or what do you think? Uh, doing some teaching tapes for Catholic Answers, and I'm interested in the uh, sociological data about why natural family planning is so identified with marital happiness, but I don't know if that's, I'm the guy to write that, but okay. down well, the road. If you do, stop on by. Okay, Patrick, thank Keep you Keep up so the much. great work of Catholic it. Answers Live. Patrick Coffin, author of Sex on Natural, what it is and why it's good for your marriage, and it's published by Emmaus Road Publishing, available through the EWTN Religious Catalog. I'm Doug Kank. Join us next time right here on EWTN's Bookmark.